someone who really doesn't need a lot of introduction in this crowd, um, but I'll just do that for a moment anyway. Um, he is called by the Rolling Stones, the real drug czar, the point man for drug policy reform in this country and increasingly nationally, formerly a professor at Princeton, 25 years ago, he started to really get involved in drug policy. And over 20 years ago, he started what is now the Drug Policy Alliance. And, and he's been here since the beginning. You know, I'm new to some of you. I've been with DPA for five years. But Ethan goes all the way back to Prop 215 and before. And he's been here and kept a large presence in California for over 20 years. And I'm so honored and touched to introduce my boss, my director, really a, a drug policy reform warrior, Ethan Nadelman. Okay, thank you very much, Lynn. That was wonderful. And Lynn's been doing an amazing job as heading up DPA's effort in uh, in California on this, not just on marijuana, but other things as well. So before I get going, and, and I should say, I, if somebody here wants to give me a five minute warning, because there's no clocks and I don't have a watch, so it could be like running into the debates before I finish here. <laughs> but let me ask you, how many of you have heard of Prop 19? Raise your hand. How many of you don't know what Prop 19 is? Raise your hand. Okay, you see all that? About 25% of hands. How many of you know what Prop 215 is? Raise your hand. How many of you don't know what Prop 215 is? Raise your hands. Because just so you know, 215 was the medical marijuana initiative in 1996 in California. And I apologize uh, because I realize in talking with you here, you ain't a movement audience. Most of you are people in the money-making side of this, right? And so, you know, part of why I'm up here is that I want to be able to talk to you not as just maybe fellow stoners and not just talk to you as people looking to make money in this new and emerging and booming green rush of a legal market. But I'm hoping that I can be talking to you so that when I say to you fellow drug policy reformers, you think, that's me, that's you, okay? And let me say why this is important. The reason why, the reason why these opportunities exist today, the reason why you're here, the reason why there's a legal marijuana industry for medical and hopefully for non-medical beginning after election day, the reason why this is happening around the country, that none of this transformation was driven by people who wanted to make money in this industry trying to change the law so they can make money legally, right? None of it was driven that way, okay? Understand, and also, by the way, this didn't emerge also because of some new uh, invention some new tech thing that just popped up and all of a sudden we got this thing. It's not like that, right? This movement, your opportunities exist here today. The reason you are here today is because a small number of people, like me, like Rob Campy, a marijuana policy project, like our friends at Normal, like Graham Boyd, and a few others, and the people we work with went out there beginning over 20 years ago to raise money from rich guys who had no financial interest in this area. We're not making money in it illegally, had no hopes to make money in it legally, but who became engaged in trying to end marijuana prohibition because of the feeling that marijuana prohibition was a monumental disaster for this country and for this world. And that arresting, right, you know, arresting 700,000 people a year 
right? Putting tens of billions of dollars into the hands of gangsters on this side of the border and across and internationally, right? That, 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 that doing things like ripping people's property because of asset forfeiture laws and taking their property away because they found a little weed or some money they thought was for weed. That, that dragging women through the, through the child custody courts because they tested positive for weed when they gave birth or when they had a little baby with no, no indication of harm to a child, right? That drug testing people in American society and saying, you can't hold a job simply because you like to smoke weed, not on the job, but the night before, the weekend before, that all of this was a disaster, right? And that it should not be allowed to continue. And more than that, more than that, it wasn't just about marijuana for most of the people I'm talking about, right? You know, if you, the guys, you look at the guys who put the money up early on, I mean, George Soros, and who's still putting it up, you know, Peter Lewis, John Sperling, somebody said George Zimmer. George Zimmer is a men's warehouse guy. John Sperling is University of Phoenix. Peter Lewis, progressive insurance. George Soros, famous philanthropist and financial investor, and a range of others. None of them were getting it into it just so that they could get high. Some of them like to get high. Some of them didn't give a damn about it. It was the notion that not just the war on marijuana and marijuana users was problematic, but that the entire drug war was fundamentally wrong, right? <laughs> and right and and what it meant was that even though we understood, and most of us understood, that the answers with cocaine and heroin, methamphetamine and psychedelics, et cetera, et cetera, was not necessarily going to be the same as marijuana. We weren't going to be looking to make an alcohol-like model for these drugs. I mean, some people feel that way, and all of us think that maybe that's the way it should be on some days. But by and large, that was not the idea. But it was the idea that this prohibitionist war on drugs right, was not just about marijuana, but everything else just the wrong thing for this country and the world. That taking America from 50,000 people behind bars in 1989 on a drug charge to half a million as of a few years ago, that putting more people in the United States behind bars on a drug charge than all of Western Europe put behind bars for everything, and they have 100 million more people than we do, that driving America's incarceration rate up to the highest in the world, more than the Russians, more than the Chinese, more than anybody, the highest incarceration rate in the history of democratic societies. America today, with barely 4% of the world's population, but over 20% of the world's incarcerated population, and that dr increase driven overwhelmingly in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s by the war on drugs, that that had to end. So why is marijuana so pivotal in all this? There's a few reasons, right? The first reason, the first reason is that the area where we could accomplish the greatest reform was on marijuana, right? We could take marijuana, unlike the other drugs where we have to talk about decriminalizing, rolling back mandatory minimum sentences, having a less harsh drug war, a kinder, to a kinder, gentler drug war, learning from the Europeans, et cetera, but with marijuana, we could actually take this thing out of the prohibition system, right? And it's why in 1996, when we did the first Prop, 2, Prop 215, the Medical Marijuana Initiative, the other initiative we did was a treatment instead of incarceration initiative for people struggling with drug addiction, right? Those were issues where we saw that a majority of Americans who had been you know, seized by the drug war of the late 80s and all the hysteria could say, wait a second, we can see it's gone too far when it comes to throwing people in jail who seriously have a drug addiction and aren't hurting other people. And we can see it's gone too far when we're telling sick people that if they want to use this medicine, they're a criminal, right? That's where this stuff came from. So please understand that, you know, that as we're moving and as we're making, moving this market in this incredibly awkward way and difficult, challenging way from an illegal market to a legal market, Understand the origins of where your opportunities emerge from. Understand that you can all make money in this stuff without having had to invest a penny in changing the laws to get where we are today. Understand also that we're standing on the shoulders of pioneers who led this stuff before. I remember back 20 years ago when this local activist on HIV and marijuana, Dennis Perone in San Francisco, you know? And basically, if Dennis had not gotten that thing going, drafting 215, for all I know, on the back of a napkin, I would not have come in then and raised the money from the big guys and get this thing and change, make California the first state in America to legalize medical marijuana, right? Going back six years ago to Richard Lee, I mean, Richard Lee's chutzpah with getting out there and saying, I'm going to try to legalize marijuana in 2010, and I and Bob Campy and other leaders are saying, no, this is too soon, Richard. It's not a presidential election year. Hold off. But when Richard said, I want to do it, I want to do it now, it's the right thing to do, we said, we'll help you on that. Now, typically, when you run a ballot initiative, 
and you lose, you lose. But with respect to Prop 19 six years ago, that initiative lost by seven points, right? But in fact, it transformed the national dialogue. It was the first time, right? I mean, I, literally in six months, we went from having people from journalists and others saying, ah, eh, legalized marijuana will never happen, to people going, how come you didn't win? Somehow a consciousness shifted at that moment. And so Richard Lee will always deserve his historical credit for having been a catalyst, even with his loss, in opening this thing up, right? Now the other piece of this is about, as we move forward, one of my fears as we try to end the broader drug war is not to leave the rest of this drug policy reform movement behind. Right? I mean, most people, you know, with marijuana, part of the reason we focused on medical marijuana back in 20 years ago was because the majority said it was time to end. Part of the reason was because the large majority of illicit drug users in America use nothing but marijuana. Right? I mean, there are a range of reasons for this, right? Half the drug arrests in America are on marijuana, although not half the people incarcerated are drug law violations. When you look at people going behind bars, right, and, and spending years behind bars for low-level cocaine and heroin and meth offenses, and it's not right either. No matter how much you hate those drugs, that's not right. And my fear now is that as we move forward with legalizing marijuana, let's not leave behind our commitment to rolling back this broader drug war. Right? You know, I mean, Drug Policy Alliance already position where we're beginning to say our 20-year commitment to marijuana legalization, we've been in a pivotal leadership role throughout with a, the first seven medical marijuana initiatives and many of the state legislative efforts, and we've had a hand in all four of the legalization efforts that have been succeeding in the United States and in Washington, D.C., and in Uruguay. But what we know is that as this thing picks a momentum of its own, our mission is going to be to some extent to try to end the broader drug war. And for example, most importantly, to advance the notion, which is already commonplace in Europe and other parts of the world, that nobody, but nobody, should lose their freedom or go to jail simply for possessing any substance for their own use, right? I mean, whether you're a recreational user of coke or an addicted user of heroin, whatever it might be, we don't know how we're gonna make it available legally or whether it's gonna be maintenance programs like you got in Europe, but what it does mean is the notion that nobody but nobody should be losing their freedom or going to jail simply for that little bit they got in their pocket or they're using, whether they're recreational or an addicted user, that's a core principle. Because it taps in to what is our underlying most core principle, which is that we ultimately must have sovereignty over our own minds and bodies. That core principle is absolutely vital. No matter what, the same way as the First Amendment just, it doesn't just protect good speech or gentle speech, it protects ugly speech and despicable speech, and we have to hold on to that. Now we begin to get in an era where elements of political correctness and protecting everybody, so we have to sacrifice the First Amendment, but you don't sacrifice the First Amendment, because when you start to sacrifice the most offensive forms of speech for all sorts of rationalizations, then you begin to sacrifice other types of speech. And they say, hey, I'm a good old marijuana and psychedelics guy, you know? I love my weed, psychedelics been good to me, you know, my profound <laughs> spiritual experiences, you know, you know, never much cared for cocaine, I gotta admit. To me it was like, you know, having too much coffee and post-nasal drip. I mean, yeah, you know, but I understand some of my friends became poets when they did cocaine. But the fact of the matter is that core principle of sovereignty of our own minds and bodies has to hold not just for the drugs that we love, but the drugs that we hate and the people who consume them. And there's another, there's another piece to this, was when you look at the origins of drug prohibition in this country, when you look at who's been disproportionately decimated by this drug war, arrested, targeted, punished, incarcerated, it is overwhelmingly people of color, black people and brown people. Goes back to the first, you know, even Asian people, right? The first, you know, anti-opium laws were about Chinese minorities coming to California and Nevada in the 1870s and 80s. The, the first anti-cocaine laws were about blacks storing cocaine in the South in the early 20th century. The first anti-marijuana laws were about Mexican Americans, Mexican migrants in the teens and the 20s in the West and the Southwest, right? You look at the origins of these laws, they're steeped in racism and racial prejudice and racial stigmatization. But then when you look at who's getting, you look in California, where for many years, 
Not one white person was prosecuted on a crack offense, even though white people, lots of white people were doing crack, right? But not just where they were looking. In my state of New York, where we had these notorious Rockefeller drug laws, and, and you, you had 95% of the people behind bars for selling or possessing cocaine and heroin were black or brown, but that was not true of 90% of the people possessing or using that drug, right? You know with marijuana that almost any place in America that if you were to randomly stop 100 black kids, 100 brown kids, 100 white kids, and look in their pockets, roughly the same percent would have a little weed in their pocket. But in every city in America, the black kid is two to 10 times more likely to get busted than the white kid. The brown kid is probably you know, two to five times more likely to get busted than the white kid. And that, on some level, I mean, how can it be that you're black, white, brown, you're doing the same thing. But that person is the one who's gonna get shafted, right? And he's gonna get shafted either because he lives in a, in a black neighborhood where you got tons more cops there, or alternatively, he's walking through a white neighborhood and people are going, what are you doing here, right? I mean, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't on this sort of stuff, right? So understanding, as I'm talking to this mostly beautiful white audience here, but let's understand, and there have been millions and millions of white people that have been slammed and killed and hurt and damaged by this horrible drug war as well. But understand that the disproportionate impact on this makes this a particularly venal public policy. And when you have a book out there by Michelle Alexander called The New Jim Crow, understanding that the war on drugs is the new Jim Crow, from slavery to Jim Crow to the modern day war on drugs. You are all part of this thing. Now, that brings me here to California right now. I live in New York, by the way. I'm not a Californian. I'm very proud of my California team for all the work they're doing this. You know, but this initiative, and I have to say I'm very thankful to one of my new favorite billionaires, Sean Parker. Because, I mean, that guy, you know, I don't, I, to my knowledge, he is not invested or planning to invest in this industry. When I've sat down and been talking with him about this, I've known him for about eight, nine years now. When we talk about this stuff, it's about good governance. It's about smart public policy. It's about moving America and the world in the right direction, right? That his commitment to doing this and the partnership that we've had with him has been absolutely pivotal to making the possibility that California is going to legalize marijuana six weeks and a day from today very, very very real, right? I mean, I'll tell you, I, I am, I'm nervous, because part of my job to be nervous, I'm not a naturally nervous person, but I mean, the fact is when those polls came out a couple days ago, first the PPIC poll and then the field poll with different methodologies, but each one of them showing 60% support for legalizing marijuana for, for, for Prop 64, I haven't had the experience of having numbers that good just six weeks to go. Now my job is not to get overconfident, it's tell you not to be overconfident as well, right? And quite frankly, any one of you can even give five bucks to help this thing over the top. I mean, I'm pouring millions of dollars into this thing, I'm raising it all over the place, I'm depriving my, the rest of my organization of other resources to do this sort of stuff. So whether you wanna go to the website, CRMR, and do it, whether you wanna go to our back table of drug policy and make a tax law, do something. Do something, just a little something, right? Just have a little skin in the game. Have, you know, have, have that feeling that when that thing wins on election day, you can say, I gave just a little bit to make this happen. Just do it, because it's the right thing to do. Just a little bit, little bit, little bit. Not gonna cost you a lot, but you're gonna feel good that you did it. You Believe me, you're gonna feel good that you did it. But I'll tell you why else. The rest of the initiatives, I think some of you know the lay of the land right now. You know, we got initiatives up in Arizona and Nevada and Maine and Massachusetts. DPA, Drug Policy Alliance, work with Marijuana Policy Project and local activists to draft these things around the country. MPP with local activists have been taking the lead on the fundraising in these other states. The polling, in the polling in almost all these states, most of the polls, most of the time, show more people in favor than against. But we know is that's no guarantee of victory especially six weeks out, especially when there are rumors of Sheldon Adelson or Adelson pouring millions of dollars into the campaign against Nevada. We're not sure if that's true yet, but we think it is. And he just bought the local paper, which went from being pro-legalization to anti, right? And he put a million dollars in against the medical marijuana initiative in Florida. And then you got some opioid manufacturer trying to get into some part of the cannabis pharmaceutical stuff, pouring money, half a million dollars into Arizona. And you got some crazy woman in Virginia who thinks all marijuana users are terrorists, pouring over a million dollars into California. So it's not as if this is just gonna be a walk in the park, right? We gotta win, well, we have to win California. This is the no lose, 
right? We have to win it. I mean, imagine how terrible it would be if we lost it. We have to win it, right? But I mean, the rest of these things, we gotta win a few of these other ones as well. And then there's medical. Florida's looking good, but there's real money on the other side. You know, Missouri broke my heart, because if we got that, just a little screw up on the signature collection, we were about to make it, and the numbers were great, and that's not gonna be on the ballot, I'm sad to say. Arkansas, oh, this is the new world. Two initiatives, both trying to make on the ballot, one trying to sue the other to get them out of there, and the one that I don't like is the one, I mean, it'll, it'll be a, that step forward, but can, you know, it's basically guys just trying to make a lot of money for themselves and not caring about the broader policy stuff, and just an ugly game. It's part of what we're getting into. We almost had that happen in Maine as well, but we were able to get both sides to get together and just do one initiative. You know, North Dakota popped up, gonna have medical marijuana, but you know, they should have called us first because they drafted this initiative, and I hope it wins, but it wasn't as good as it could be, you know? In Montana, they're trying to fix something in the past. This is gonna be the year of marijuana come election day. Five legalization initiatives, three or four medical. I don't think we can win all of them. I hope we can. I'm reassured by the fact that in all four states that won, Alaska, Washington, Colorado, and uh, uh, Oregon, in every one of them, the final tally, 55% in favor in three of those states, and Alaska a little less, was higher than we expected in the late polls. So I'm hoping that there's that thing lurking out there that's gonna be good, right? But here's why I feel special about California. I mean, it's not just that you guys were first with 215. And I feel bad you didn't go first with legalization. You know, but you got your moment now. And the fact of the matter is the market here is more than double the size of all the four other states that have already legalized, right? And the fact of the matter is that all eyes are on California. And it may be a very blue state, but all eyes are still on California. But there's some other things going on with this initiative. Apart from the fact that it is the most thoughtfully designed initiative ever to happen in the marijuana field. Apart from the fact that one of my key co colleagues, Tamar Todd, who's been the lead drafter of many marijuana initiatives around the country, did inter you know, basically interviewed hundreds of stakeholders from Humboldt to LA to industry to government to what have you and got it in. Apart from the fact that even many of the people who were competing with Prop 64 to get their own initiative are now joining hands on 64 and saying, we gotta win this and I'm very grateful for the folks who are willing to do that after the time. It was like, it was almost like being in a primary battle. Where all of a sudden you come out of the primaries, everybody's gotta get behind the one on one. But that's really beginning to happen now. But there's some other stuff going on in this initiative that's really important. The fact that it's the first statewide initiative on marijuana to be endorsed by the Statewide Medical Association, California Medical Association, unprecedented. The fact that it's got the endorsements of major environmental groups, right? I mean, absolutely, one of them just came out a couple days ago, also unprecedented in that way. Right? The support we're getting from unions and others, absolutely pivotal, from civil rights groups, absolutely pivotal. But you know what else is special? This is not just about legalizing weed. It's also about sentencing reform and about social justice and about human rights. You know, this initiative basically says that if you've ever been convicted of a drug felony, that cannot be the sole basis of excluding you from getting a legal license in the new legal market. And that is pivotally important given the grossly disproportionate way that people of color have been landed up with criminal convictions for doing the same thing that white people have been doing for a long, long time. This is the first initiative that basically says, I think it's the first one, if you've ever been convicted of any marijuana offense that would no longer be an offense under Prop 64, you can apply, even if you're still behind bars, to have that, fun, that offense expunged or removed from your record. <laughs> this initiative, I believe, is the first one that says if you are under the age of 18 and you get picked up with weed, you may get an infraction and have to do a little community service or something. But when you turn the age of 18, that offense you got before you were 18 is automatically wiped off your record. Hundreds of thousands of people in California have been hurt by these laws and have these things hanging around the records. This initiative is the first one that says up to $50 million after a few years is gonna go specifically to help those communities that have been harmed by the drug war. Right? You know? 
and 60% of the money is gonna go to help kids and not bullshit stuff, but stuff that we wrote in there to make it real. And 20% of that stuff is gonna go for environmental, not just cleaning up the mess that some growers have made over the years, but even trying to invest in smart environmental stuff, in parks, maintenance, that sort of stuff. And 20% is gonna go for local law enforcement, but only in those communities, right, that actually are allowing the retail sale right, and production of cannabis, okay? So, but the other reason I care about this thing, it's not just that when this passes in California Election Day that it's gonna reverberate throughout the country. It's gonna reverberate globally, right? I gotta tell you, about a year and a half ago, I was on a plane going from San Francisco to Mexico City. And I looked to my right about an hour before we went, and there's sitting Jerry Brown and his wife. And the last time I knew Jerry Brown when he was the mayor of Oakland, and then we had a really vicious fight on television right before a ballot edition of 2008. I hadn't seen him since then. Went over, said hello. He remembered the vicious fight. But we put that <laughs> behind us. Uh, you want to see that. Go on YouTube and type in the words either rude debate or really rude debate. What pops up is me and Jerry <laughs> being unfriendly with one another. Um, but I said, you know, what are you gonna, are, are you gonna see President Peña Nieto down there? He said, yeah. So well, what are you gonna say if he asked you about legalizing marijuana in California? He said, I don't know, I don't know. I said, well, you know, you, what, what should I say? I said, well, you know, look, the fact is we're gonna get on the ballot and it's probably gonna win, right? Well, you know, you know marijuana is gonna be the damnation of civilization and society and da 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 You know, I'm like, looking at it, what, are you crazy? You know, half people know Jerry Brown said he used to smoke, other half don't. I don't know what the truth is. Yeah, she said she could find, we have confirmation right here that he used to smoke. So who the hell knows what? Maybe he had a bad trip sometime. But any, the fact of the matter is he did go, he did meet with President Peña Nieto. President Peña did ask him what he thought. And Jerry Brown said, I think it's going to be on, I think it's going to win. And said nothing bad, right? And we're hoping he continues to say nothing bad. Right? I mean, the fact is it's going to be a billion dollars in tax revenue, and this guy's legacy is solving your state's budget crisis. You know, it's got to look promising. And the fact that there's been some law enforcement buy in and other stuff like that, got to be promising. But the fact is, you go down to Mexico, and I ask my Mexican friends and allies and government people, what's it going to take to change the, the drug war in Mexico and the whole thing, 100,000 dead in the drug wars in Mexico, last, last 10 years, last five years? And they say, when California legalizes marijuana. And I'll say, what about. Washington, Colorado, they said that helped. What about Oregon, Alaska, that helped. But California, if you could do Texas too, that'd be big, but California, right? It is gonna reverberate in Mexico, in Central America, the Caribbean, and in Latin America. We've been working with our Latin American allies to try to roll back the drug war there, and they keep banging their heads, and this peace agreement that's gonna happen in Colombia between the FARC, the left-wing guerrillas who have been involved in drug dealing, and the government look very promising. But I mean, quite frankly, even in Latin America now, they want to know what's going on with marijuana in the U.S. Medical marijuana from Brazil to Colombia to Mexico to Costa Rica to Chile is the issue that's moving. And they're seeing how the medical marijuana issue back to the late 90s, early 2000s helped to transform the dialogue in our country and to change the face of marijuana and educate people who were closed on marijuana. And they see that's the way things are moving as well, right? People in Jamaica where they're trying to inch their way towards legalization, but they're still scared of what the U.S. government will do to them in one way or another. California goes, it gets very hard for anybody to start rolling this stuff back at this point. It's still not gonna be 100% in the bag, right? Bigger events have been turned around in the past, but it's going to be huge. It means that when we go to the United Nations and are talking about are we gonna keep cannabis in these international conventions that we have that much more traction, right? It means that when Canada hopefully moves forward to legalize marijuana next year, and God bless Justin Trudeau, we need leadership like that, you know? I, I gotta tell you, you look around the world now, you look at that bastard Putin, the biggest mafiosi in the world. You look at Chinese leadership, Xi is just becoming a dictator. You look at Erdogan in Turkey. You look at what's going on in, in Hungary and in Poland. You look at the mess in Brazil and practical civil disorder in Venezuela. I mean, you look at this ugliness going on. And I gotta say, I look around and say, who's good out there? Justin Trudeau's at the top of my list. Yeah. I kind of like the Pope too, even though he's kind of closed on this issue. And truth be told, I mean, we slammed President Obama in his first term. And his people would say, if we get a second term, we'll be there. And I gotta hand it to him. 
Do not take for granted the extent to which the White House and the Justice Department have allowed this stuff to proceed. That was not inevitable. And the fact that they still have a DEA saying bullshit all the time and a National Institute of Drug Abuse doing bullshit all the time and that Obama's kind of letting that whole conflict play out. But the fact of the matter is what's opening up here, notwithstanding what the letter of federal law, is a credit to this administration, right? You know, now, I'm not supposed, let me take off my, how much time do I have left, by the way? So, uh, a, few, a few more minutes. Few more, okay. I'll just, I won't go through this long here. So let me just take off my Drug Policy Alliance hat here and my drug, po you know, and just speak personally for a second about the spectacle that's going to happen tonight and over the next six weeks. Um, from a drug policy perspective, there is no question but that Hillary is better than the other guy. And I mean, it did not reassure me that Governor Christie, who's been mixed on these issues, right? We've worked, we have an office in New Jersey. He's been mixed on this stuff. You never know, like last week, week ago, he okayed medical marijuana for PTSD. But meanwhile, he's in the primary saying, smoke your weed now, because if I become president, I'm gonna bust you all, right? I mean, so he's unreal. But the thought of him as a potential attorney general candidate or something, not promising. Sheldon Adelson, I saw he just screwed Trump. You're only getting him five million, a hundred million. He's pouring into the Republicans, right? But the fact that Adelson was the first major Republican donor to say, "I'll back that guy," and Adelson, meanwhile, is pouring the only guy pouring seven figures money against marijuana reform, right? Not promising. And that his VP is Mike Pence from Indiana who has been the far evil side on the drug war. I mean, finally, as governor, he finally agreed to allow a little needle exchange where a whole ton of people, basically white people, started getting HIV and stuff like that. And so he really had to do something. But he's been a nightmare as well. So I realize that Trump, you know, he's a New Yorker. He doesn't give a damn. He could say it. In fact, I think he did 20 years ago, said, let's legalize all drugs. And then he'll say something else. I mean, you know, whatever comes out of his mouth, you can't count on anything. He could flip-flop any which way. But the people around him and the people who appoint, not good. Hillary, she doesn't have this in her, you know, I mean, Obama was more cool with it. But Hillary is going to Democratic fundraisers and saying, I promise you I will be at least as good as Obama was on this. And that's important. That's important. Right? She's willing to sign on to stuff about ending the drug war in a big way. She gets the problems of mass incarceration. She gets some of this stuff. She's paying attention. So from that, and look, Gary Johnson, libertarian. <laughs> Listen, Gary, we opened an office in New Mexico back in January 2000 when Gary was governor of New Mexico. And he and I became fairly close, right? He was a libertarian Republican governor, wanted to move drug policy reform in, in the right direction, right? And, 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 and basically the Democratic legislature hated him because he was vetoing all the spending bills. And we opened up to work in a bipartisan way with the both of them. Gary, Gary Johnson signed a whole host of things from giving back former felons the right to vote to all forms of diversion programs to getting behind our medical marijuana bill, which only passed some years later. I think it may well be Gary Johnson increased state spending on drug treatment by 50%. That libertarian cost-cutting governor, did, and I think we brought out the best in Gary. He did the right stuff there. He did the right stuff. But the fact of the matter is, there's an election happening. If you live in a non-swing state, you're in California, you're in New York, you're in Mississippi, you're in whatever it is, vote for Gary, vote for Jill Stein, vote for whoever you want to do. But if you live in a swing state, there's a real choice now, a real choice. Whether it's about drug policy, and don't let, get me going on my personal views about the future of the country in this world, and you know, so I'll leave that as. Back to my drink PA hat. So, going forward. My hope is that this industry as it grows, as it becomes more dynamic, can become a model of a legal industry. Now, mind you, there's tactical reasons for it to do that, because this thing is not in the bag as yet. 
And if this thing goes south, if all of a sudden there's a whole lot of bad product on the market, if all of a sudden we have major increases in adolescent marijuana use and things like that, we got a problem on our hands, right? If all of a sudden there's all tons of, tons of marijuana being produced legally but shipped out of state across state lines to states that, that we got a problem on our hand, right? We know that the Obama administration gave the states that legalized a qualified green light to proceed, but there's a whole bunch of conditions, right? We know that they said, hey, listen, the 1970 Federal Sub Control Substance Act says it's in the interest of drug policy behind but advancing public health and public safety. Marijuana legalization to keep moving forward safely has to continue to be about advancing public health and public safety. That's how we succeed. But I think because of the origins of where this all came from, remember, this has basically never happened before. There has never been a social justice movement in American history that resulted in the emergence of a legal industry worth tens of billions of dollars a year. I mean, if you look at the other social justice movements that we sometimes model ourselves on, or whose shoulders you know, we, we step on as we move forward, you know, gay rights, civil rights, women's rights, all of those movements as they proceeded in America had significant economic consequences. But no one of them created a brand new industry worth tens of billions of dollars. The closest analogy, historically, is the repeal of alcohol prohibition. But even there, that was essentially just re-legalizing a market that had been legal just 15 years before. We are doing something unprecedented and truly new. It is truly special. The benefit that will happen almost automatically is that people getting busted, especially black and brown people getting busted for drugs, that that opportunity is just no longer to be there for them to get busted. It means that as we move forward to legalize marijuana in the states where a majority support that, we cannot forget about what's happening in the South and other parts of this country where you still have people serving many years behind bars for a second or third marijuana possession offense. We cannot forget about the half the states where marijuana is not even legal for medical purposes as yet. We cannot forget about the millions of Americans continuing to be victimized in the workplace or the courts in all sorts of ways and disproportionately victimized if you are poor, if you are young, or if you are a color. We cannot forget about that. As you're making the money, man, remember that piece and fight for that. So I want to make this pitch to you. Think about as you move forward, making a promise to do just one good thing. Just one good thing to make legalization of marijuana a better thing for society and the world. And by what I mean by one good thing, I mean something that does not help directly or even indirectly, maybe indirectly, indirectly, but does not help your bottom line. It means the notion of tithing one, two, five, ten percent of your sales or your profits to helping advance this cause further. It means making a commitment to diversity in this industry. It means making a commitment to setting up some little mentoring program so that people who might not otherwise have a chance to get into this industry can get into it. It means taking real pride in the quality of your product and in the way you try to make sure that the that people, young people are not getting involved in this stuff and that you are really being careful and responsible about this stuff. There's, make that commitment to yourself. You can tell me later if you want to do whatever, but just make the commitment to do one good thing. Just one good thing, okay? Because you, I, I'm in California. I don't know how many of you know what, what the word mensch means. You know, mensch is a Yiddish word. It basically Yiddish word refers to a, a man or a human being. And what it really refers to is a human being who uses their head and their heart, you know, in the right ways in life, right? To treat their fellow human beings decently, and et cetera, right? And so I remember being as a TV program, saying, what's your vision of a drug policy? Is legalization? Eh, it's not just all drug legalization. I think we need to think about it, arguments for it. But no, it's more subtle than that. Well, are you talking about just a kinder, gentler drug war? No, 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 kind of. What I'm talking about is the menschkeit approach to drug policy. I'm talking about a way of dealing with drugs and drug users and drug markets 
that's about doing the right thing, making this thing fair. I would love to see, that, you know, I, I'm kind of a small as beautiful guy. I would just as soon not see big alcohol, tobacco, pharmaceutical, consumer goods companies take over this whole thing, right? I'd like to see, you know, the, the microbrewery market or the vineyard market be a dominant modality here. I'd like to see us get to the day when maybe we could have farmers markets in some parts of this country with some quality controls, but like to see, I'd like to see that. I'd like to see this industry be reasonably taxed in a productive way so that basically the illicit side is essentially fading away. Right? I'd like to see us work side by side while the pharmaceutical companies are producing their isolated you know, products from the cannabis plant in ways that are going to help people. Right? I'd like to see us do all these things in the right way. I think we can do it. We can do it. So come election day, you know what to do. But don't just vote for Prop 64. Look at the rest of the ballot. There's another initiative that Jerry Brown's actually behind. Never thought I'd be getting behind Jerry Brown, but Prop 57 which is about parole reform and juvenile justice reform, putting fewer people behind bars. When you pull the lever for 64, pull the lever for 57 as well, right? When we get into implementation, be at the table, do so. I understand you gotta protect your interests, in, but do it in the right way. So just to conclude, we are now beginning the second generation of the global drug policy reform movement. We've gone from 215 and 96 legalizing medical marijuana to over half the states legalizing marijuana to California about to legalize marijuana six weeks from now and create a whole new model for how to do this thing right. right? We, the, we are turning the country and we're beginning to back away from mass incarceration, but if we hit the tipping point of marijuana legalization, we barely hit a turning point when it comes to ending mass incarceration in this country. You know, actually it's nice, I mean, somebody say, where we are in mass incarceration, we've hit a turning point, but it's like turning around an ocean liner. I've never, I've never actually said that on an ocean liner. But it means that even when you point that in a new direction, it takes time to turn. And it means when we're talking with people who use drugs, no matter what that drug is, no matter how much you hate that drug or had a bad trip with that drug, we're not gonna demonize people simply because they use that drug. And if they use that drug and don't hurt anybody else, it's none of the government's business or even their employer's business so long as they're doing their job. And if they're struggling, if they're struggling with addiction, it means don't just whack them over the head and lock them up. Don't throw them into some drug court which is gonna keep trying to chip them up and put them in there for longer if they can't be clean, clean, clean. It means let's do this the right way. So listen everybody, best of luck on election day. Make it happen, make it happen, make lots of money, do the right thing. Thank you so much.